So, okay. Yeah, so what does this evaluate to? A of 1. Yeah, 0, right? Because if I integrate anything from 1 to 1 or from 2 to 2, or from a, um, if the lower and upper limits of integration are the same, then the definite integral will evaluate to 0 because I, I won't have any width, basically. Right? So A of 1 is just 0. Okay, so now let's look at A of 2. So this is the integral from 1 to 2 of the function 4 minus t dt. All right, if I'm integrating from 1 to 2, then I'm just looking at the area under the curve on that closed interval. So this is kind of a small picture. Okay, and this area will be, you can divide this up into a triangle and a rectangle. All right. If I plug 1 into this, it has value 3. If I plug 2 into it, it has value 2, because it's just 4 minus t. So there's a rectangle and a triangle. Like what this shape, if I kind of like blow this up, There's a rectangle and a triangle. The base of both of them goes from 1 to 2. So they both have base 1. It is. It's a trapezoid, yes. Mm -hmm. So we could use the area of a trapezoid, but most people don't remember the area of a trapezoid uh, formula, or at least they're not as familiar with it as a triangle and a rectangle. All right. The height of the rectangle goes from 0 to 2. All right. The height of the triangle goes between y coordinates 2 and 3. So it also just so annoying. So it also just has area 1. Go away. Or sorry, it also has height 1. Okay? So the integral from 1 to 2 will be the area of the triangle plus the area of the rectangle. So that will just be, so the rectangle has area 1 times 2. The triangle has area 1 half base times height. So we get 2 plus 1 half. Or 5 halves. Okay, so I want y'all, I'm going to break out into groups, and I want y'all to try to answer A of 4 and A of 5, and I'll also answer B. So this is similar to your homework question. Find the intervals on which A is increasing. So remember, this A is this function here. All right, so A of 2 was 5 halves. So for example, I was increasing as I go from 1 to 2, right? The area under the curve went from 0 to 5 halves.
All right, so what do y'all think here? What's the, what is the base and height of the triangle? You don't plug in anything for uh, DT. DT is kind of don't don't guys don't change the page yet. DT is just changing, telling you sort of like the variable you're integrating with. It represents like um, it's kind of the analog to the delta x from the Riemann sum. It's basically like the, a width. It's kind of like representing like an infinitesimal like width, and the four minus t gives you the height. So you're integrating the height of this function uh, over the interval from one to x or one to four in this case. So yeah, you don't you don't plug in anything for dt. So the base would be three because you're going from one to four. The height would be whatever the value of the function is at one. So what's the value of the function at 1? Yeah, exactly. OK, so that would be a of 4. It's just, it's just the area under the curve from 1 to 4. Oh, no. Aliens. All right, so what did we get uh, for A of four? Indeed. Nine over two. Good. Okay, if I'm integrating uh, from 1 to 4, then it's just a triangle, all right? And it's a triangle with height 3 and base 3, all right? Finally, if I'm integrating from 1 to 5, If I integrate from 1 to 5, then I'll also be including this little like negative um, area, which is also a triangle. So you just take um, the value of the positive triangle, which we just found to be 9 halves, and you subtract the area of the triangle that's below the x-axis. So what's the area of this little triangle here? So what's the area? Yeah, 1 half, right? So you take... nine halves minus one half, which is eight halves or four. Okay, good. Um, on what interval is A increasing? Good, from one to four. Okay, as I go past four, I start to include negative area. So the, the actual area, the net area will be decreasing. All right, if I went to the left of one, so if I integrated from like one to zero, the area is positive, but then the limits of integration are backwards. So then I would pick up the negative there as well. So I would be decreasing from negative infinity to 1, 
and from four to infinity. Why is it decreasing? Where? How? What? So assume it goes on forever, like in both directions. The function is defined on all real numbers. Yeah, yeah. OK, so now we can state um, the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, which lets us take. So it's decreasing from 0 to 1, because if I looked, if I took the integral, or if I took, like, what is a of 0, for example? It's the integral from 1 to 0 of this function 4 minus t uh, dt. Right? Because the bottom limit is fixed. Yeah. So if I if I go to the left, the area will be positive. But since the since you would really need to like flip the limits of integration, you pick up the negative sign according to these rules for definite integrals that we have. Okay, so let's look at uh, now the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. It basically tells us how do you take the derivative of an air of this of an area function like this. Okay, so again, just to write this, we have this function more generally as a of x, the integral from a to x, f of t dt. So what is the that's, and this is a function and it's continuous, uh, and indeed it's differentiable here. So what what does its derivative look like? So it says that if f is continuous on the closed interval from a to b, and if x is some va value in the open interval from a to b, then the derivative of this area function is just f of x. All right, so a is an antiderivative of f. Okay, so if I let f of t be as before, the fundamental theorem here is just saying that a prime of 1 is equal to f of 1, which is just 4 minus 1 or 3. All right, a prime of 4 is equal to f of 4, which is just 4 minus 4, or 0. And then finally, a prime of 5 is equal to f of 5, which is 4 minus 5, or negative 1. Okay, and there should be some consistency with the, the sign of these values and what we said about where is a increasing. So, for example, we said that a, um, oh, sorry, 4 minus 1. So, for example, we said that we were decreasing to the right of 4. So, we get, we get this derivative negative 1. Okay, and the sign of that should be consistent. Um, part A and part C. They don't exactly match because A is measuring an area and A prime is measuring like um, a difference. Uh, I see I actually made a mistake here. The function's not decreasing from negative infinity to 1. It's negative to the left of 1, but it's not decreasing there. The area is still increasing as I move from left to right. So really, it should be increasing.
from negative infinity up to 4, and it's decreasing. from 4 to infinity. Okay. All right, so now let's see how we can use this to evaluate um, derivatives of certain functions where these functions are, are, are like expressed as these area type of functions, all right? So for example, if I take, uh, uh, one thing I do want to note is that note how like the, the value here or the derivative doesn't depend on A, okay? So for A prime here, like if we go back to our, our explicit function A, the value of the derivative doesn't depend on that lower limit. I, it could have been one or two or five or what have you, and the derivative doesn't depend on that, okay? All right, so now let's evaluate the following derivatives. So note that the limits of integration uh, and variable of differentiation are changing from part to part, okay? So here my function is the integral from pi to x of sine of t uh, over t dt. So what is the derivative here? So the derivative, it's a function of x. So f of t is sine of t over t, but it's a function of x. So my derivative should be, yeah, right, sine of x over x. Well, I'm taking the derivative with respect. This is a function of x. Like this is like a of x equals the integral from pi to x sine t over t dt. The variable of the function is x. Like it changes with x. If I want to know what is a of 5, I plug in 5 as my upper limit of integration, and I take the area under the curve between pi and five of this function, sine over sine over t. So t is not really changing to x. Like the variable of the function is x. T is just a dummy variable. Yeah. So pay yeah. So pay attention to like what we're differentiating with respect to. Okay. How about b? If I take the derivative with respect to u, so now u is a variable from pi to u of sine of t over dt. What will this give me? Yeah, exactly, good. Okay, from, if I integrate from z to pi and I take the derivative um, with respect to z, of sine of t over t dt, all right? So I'm gonna show you like, so this is kind of different. This is in a different form than what we've seen. Before it was going, we would have looked at it from where the lower limit was a constant, but now our upper limit's a constant. So how does this affect things? So one way to treat this would be to just flip the limits of integration, and then you would apply the fundamental theorem. So I could think of this as d over dz, and I could flip the limits of integration so it goes from pi to z, and then I just pick up this negative sign. Okay, so the negative sign is just like multiplying my function by negative one. And if I multiply a function by a constant, then when I take the derivative, I just like multiply the derivative by that same constant. So what will what will the derivative with respect to z of this be? 
Good. Negative sine z. God, why does it do that? Negative sine z over z. Okay. What if our what if one of our bounds of integration is not like x or u or z or whatever, but it's a function of x or u or z? How do we deal with that? Okay. If I want to take the derivative of this function. Okay. So one way, the way I'm going to show you how to do this is basically I want to think of like my base function as a of x, which is this area function, and it goes from one to x of sine t over t dt. So this is this is not the same thing that's in parentheses here in part d. The way I could recover that expression is I could think of it as a of x squared. And this would be 1 to x squared sine t over t dt. Okay? So I'm taking I'm not taking the derivative of a of x I'm really taking the derivative of a, a of x squared which is really a composition of functions. Which means I'll use the chain rule. Okay? So the derivative of a of x squared according to the chain rule the outer function is a and the inner function is x squared. So I'll take the derivative of a, and then I'll multiply it by the derivative of the inside, which is 2x. OK, so when I take the derivative of the integral from 1 to x squared, sine t over t dt, the first thing, the first term will be a prime evaluated at x squared. So what do you think that will look like? Yeah, exactly. Good. It's just like instead of plugging in x, I'll plug in x squared to f of t. Okay, but then I'll, according to the chain rule, I'll need to multiply this term by something. So what will I multiply it by? Yes, 2x. Mm -hmm. So you're really, you're kind of just using the chain rule, like rather than plugging in x into this sine of t over, or rather than replacing t with x, you replace t with x squared, and then you multiply by the derivative of x squared. Okay, you could think about us as having done that in the first part as well, where we, we replaced the t in f of t with x, and then we multiplied by the derivative of x. But the derivative of x is just 1, so it doesn't affect the function. Okay, so now that will bring us to, so we'll, we'll spend another day on this stuff on Monday as well. Um, but now that will bring us to the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is in sort of like what I think about um, when I think about the fundamental theorem. And this will allow us to actually evaluate these definite integrals using antiderivatives rather than trying to take some like crazy Riemann sum. All right. So we start off with some function f, which is continuous, and let capital F be an an, any antiderivative of f. So remember that means that capital F is a function whose derivative is, is lowercase f. All right? Then the integral from a to b of f of x dx will be capital F evaluated at B minus capital F evaluated at A. All right, 
and there's a little like proof here that it doesn't it's it says it could be any antiderivative and that's true because all all the antiderivatives are the same up to some constant c so if i took any other antiderivative i could write it as capital f plus c and then when i evaluate it at b and a i end up getting the same thing back no matter what Okay, so now let's let's use this theorem to evaluate some definite integrals. Okay, so the first question says, find the area under one arc of the function sine of x. All right, so sine of x kind of looks like this over one period. So if I'm trying to find the area under the curve sine of x under like one arc, what should I take my limits of integration to be? So this means like one hill, basically. Yeah, good, from zero to pi. And then I'm integrating the function sine x with respect to x. OK, so what we want to do is we want to find an antiderivative of sine. All right, so what is a function whose derivative would give me sine? Good. Ne it's, yeah, so cosine is the right idea, but the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So the derivative of negative cosine is positive sine. Okay, good. So the fundamental theorem, so one, an antiderivative, so let's see. All right, so negative cosine x is an antiderivative of sine. And you're right, negative cosine x plus c is like general, like the general form. But we, in this case, we kind of like, when you're doing a definite integral, we don't need to worry about the c because it's the, the result is true for any antiderivative. So we just pick the most convenient one. Okay, so that means I'll just evaluate negative cosine at b, which is the higher, the upper limit of integration. So negative cosine of pi minus negative cosine evaluated at the lower limit of integration, which is zero. All right, so what is cosine of pi? Good, negative one. So this is negative, negative one minus and then what is cosine of zero? One, so minus one. So this ends up being one plus one or two. All right, so the area under the curve here is two. All right, so I'm going to split y'all into groups, and I want y'all to work on A and this one here, the integral from 0 to the natural log of 8 of e to the x. So you'll find an antiderivative of the integrand, and then you'll, you'll plug in the, uh, the upper limit and subtract from it plugging in the lower limit.
Okay, so let's look at these. Um, so here we're trying to find an antiderivative of root x plus 1. All right, so recall there was this rule for um, like an antiderivative power rule. Oh, thank you. which said that an antiderivative for x to the n was x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1, and then plus c. OK, so we could use that here um, and in this problem as well. So remember that root x, you can write as x to the 1 half. OK? So an antiderivative for root x becomes x to the 1 half plus 1, which is 3 halves, divided by 3 halves. OK, plus what's an antiderivative for 1? Just x, good. All right, so this notation that I'm using here is, is just kind of like a shorthand for um, uh, taking an antiderivative, and then you, you like put the limits of integration on the right. And this basically means the same thing as, OK, well, now I'll plug these values in. So I plug 1 in, and I get 1 to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves plus 1. And then I subtract plugging 0 into the antiderivative. So I get 0 to the 3 halves over 3 halves plus 0. All right, and this ends up just evaluating to, so 1 to the 3 halves is just 1. 1 divided by 3 halves is 2 thirds. So 2 thirds plus 1, which is 5 thirds. Um, which x? So the antiderivative of one is just is just x. Um, you you take the antiderivative separately. I did, yeah, I did divide it by three halves. I did, I did, I did. Okay. All right, let's look at um, this e to the x one, all right? So what is an antiderivative of e to the x? Good, just e to the x. So an antiderivative is e to the x. And then we're sort of evaluating this at these limits of integration, ln of 8 and 0. So this, this integral evaluates to e to the ln 8 minus e to the 0. All right, what is e to the ln of 8? Good. What's e to the 0? 
1. Good. So this comes out to 7. Okay. So that's how we'll apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. We'll do a lot more examples uh, on Monday. Um, I think that's it for now. I'll, I'll, I'll write out solutions for these other problems, though, at, when I post it. All right. So that's all for now. Um, thanks for stopping by. Yeah. I'll see you all on Friday. Yep, review on Friday. Okay, stay safe.